Good morning. This is not my time of day. I warn you right now. Uh, and so, Anne is correct when she says that every poem is in some way occasioned. Uh, it, it exists in its bubble of time and the pressure that's around it. The poem is written fully, I think, cognizant of the moment, a moment which can be as intimate as a glance or a gas or a sigh or something more large, something larger and more public. And, and when I was first asked if I would participate in this panel, I thought, well, I don't write occasional poems. And then I thought about it and I realized every poem I've ever written practically had been occasioned in some way, starting with the very first one, which was that I remember and that I was proud of, which was at age 10, and we were all asked to do something for Easter in fourth grade, and I wrote a poem. Uh, about a rabbit with a droopy ear. I was an outsider at that time. Um, but <laughs> it, was, it was a visceral response to this kind of pat, pat Easter uh, sensation. So um, it's, it has carried on since then. Um, I thought what I'd do today, because I was, I've done several poems which were kind of occasional in the sense that the occasion called me to it before someone else called me and said, would you do it for the occasion? And uh, one of those, uh, for instance, when I was poet laureate, um, I went down to Washington, D.C. just to check out the poetry office and see what this, what this office meant. No one seemed to know. Um, I walked into the poetry office and looked across the street and looked down on, on the U.S. Capitol. And at that time, this was 1993, at that time, uh, the top of the Capitol building the statue of their Lady Freedom had been brought down for cleaning. And so she was sitting down there, large and out of place and dirty and homeless. And just standing there realizing that, realizing that I was now going to somehow assume a public <coughs> face for something that I considered a very private uh, experience made me, I, I looked and I thought, there's got to be a way to restore, to, to restore poetry to this publication. And, it, and it, it was really just the idea of becoming a poet lawyer, whatever that was, that made me start to write a poem that called Lady Freedom Among Us, which then, about five months later, in October, I was asked if I would say a few words at the reinstallment of Lady Freeman Freedom on top of the dome. And I could say, kind of say, oh sure, I'll be happy to. <laughs> Which was already written. What, what I mean by all of that is that that I found through the years the, the one thing that helps when you're asked to write a vocational poem and you do feel that you want to write that vocational is to remember the, is to really seriously think about the person who is in the audience out there and what you would, what that, that moment, that ephemeral moment that Anne talked about would uh, be like, how can you help create it? And that takes some of the pressure, I think, off of, uh, oh my gosh, I've got to write something that, that's going to be memorable. I think to remember that it is ephemeral is really helpful. Um, because in a sense, the soul rises to the occasion, you know, by stepping out of itself in order to communicate with an exterior presence. It's like Emily Dickinson said, you know, this is my letter to the world that never wrote to me. And to remember that at times has been really helpful for me. Um, I wanted to talk also, however, about another kind of occasional poem and that is the occasion where one is asked to collaborate with someone else. And I highly recommend this for anyone. Just, I mean, I do think the cross-genre experience is really important because it stretches you, makes you realize the, the, the capabilities of the word, how far it can be stretched to reach into other disciplines. And I'd like to talk about, out of personal experience, a, a few of these collaborations. Um, I have been 
a musician pretty much all my life. I played the cello and real the gamba, and then I started taking voice lessons when I couldn't carry my cello around because I needed music with me. But what that has helped me do on occasion is to write, to write poems with musicians. And I'm not talking about handing a poem to someone and saying, you know, here, you know, make this, and they set to music, though I've had the pleasure of had that, having that done as well. But actually sitting down with a musician or with a composer and doing it together out of scratch. And the wonderful thing about that is that you learn certain things about how the human voice carries in a room. To remember that when someone is listening to you and they don't have the text before you, certain words are going to get lost. Certain vowels will not carry. Uh, S's will just hiss all over the place. You know, these kind of things which are certainly like writing prompts. They're like those things that, 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 that hem you in. It's like telling you to do a haiku, right? Uh, so, to sit down with a composer is really a, a great experience in, in, in that regard. Uh, when I was asked in 1999, of course it was a millennium and we all thought we were going to die, and so let's go out with a bang. And, and one of the things that um, Clinton, President Clinton, had commissioned was the idea of, of doing a millennium firework display in front of uh, the Lincoln Memorial, right at midnight. And to do this, uh, they had gathered together a, a kind of team of all sorts of people. Steven Spielberg did a movie, a kind of slideshow behind us, and a movie as well, called The Unfinished Journey, America, The Unfinished Journey. John Williams composed the music. Uh, Ken Burns was sitting in this room with us, and Doris Prince Goodwin, and I was the poet, and I'm like, holy, holy. Uh, and, and so they had this, this kind of jam thing. We were supposed to have a think tank session. We're going to throw things out, and I'm like, I don't work this way. I really don't work this way. But what I did was, I, I took notes, and I was very quiet, and I listened to them throw out images and ideas, and uh, so that I could get a sense of what they were going to do, because I thought, okay, music carries, there's no problem with that. Visuals are, they know how to address a huge audience. How do you make the big moment intimate? And it was, and I, and I had one section of this, and there were other poets involved as well, I, but I had one section of this to do, and I thought, okay, you're going to stand up there, and everyone's gonna be cold as heck, because it's you know, December, so it must be short, and it must, it has to carry, it has to be simple, but it has to also be crisp. And that took some of the pressure off the, the notion that I had to get up there and uh, do this thing as well. And to realize that it would disappear. I think to have that, well, we all hope that we have this lack of ego, I think, when we approach the page. If we don't do that, uh, if we don't have that lack of ego, the poem is pompous and it's, it's overheard, it, it, it's not really, anything that opens us into ourselves. And I think that, that, that an occasional poem, if it, if it really is successful, if it really works, it occasions in each of the audience, if the ones standing out there, you know, just a sense of intimacy in the middle of the open space and a, a, a feeling of being part of the tribe, but also an individual who is buoyed by the, by the, by the tribe. So uh, that was one of the things that, that I think helped me in that regard. I think I'm a sucker for punishment because I do tend to agree to collaborations that are really, really ridiculous for <laughs> poets to try to do. But it's an idea of like, let's see what happens. A another occasion was um, in was it, 1989, I believe. 1989, I had uh, been in residence at the National Humanities Center in uh, North Carolina, and there was a tradition that every class, and most of the people in there are humanities scholars, and they let a poet in occasionally, or an artist, and every class gave a class gift at the end. Well, our class decided that they wanted a collaboration between the poet and the artist, 
the artist was Ava Hood of a wonderful uh, installation by three dimensional artist. And we thought about it and we agreed. And then uh, what happened was this. We looked, we walked around the humanity center, which is a kind of a glass enclosed a building which was beautiful to be in because of all the light, but was extremely dangerous for birds because they would crash into it. So they had all the shadow bird, you know, decals on the windows that the architect had wanted to be clear that that's not going to work in the practical world. And we walked and we said, we have to do something with this kind of disjunction. And in the end, what happened was that I won't go into the whole description of it because it's very difficult to talk about the, the visual, but Ava had a scroll of, of muslin, like, like an old Asian scroll, with lots of images on it. And then she had another uh, plexiglass case, a horizontal case, which had a, a literal scroll that the poem was going to have. This meant that only about 24 inches of the poem could be seen at any time. It was two pages worth. There was more, but it was hidden. You could scroll it out if you wanted to. But it, and, and the whole idea of, of breaking up the narrative that way, that there was, that I had no, I could not predict who was going to read what, you know, was extremely interesting to me. And so I, I learned a lot about narrative. I learned a lot about this is a public space. This is an occasion for, but it's extremely intimate. With only one person at a time, I could stand before it and do it. And and what happened was that I I um, also was given a huge. I think it's like 25 feet of muslin. And she said, and some absolutely non-erasable pens. <laughs> <laughs> and I put your poem on it. And uh, so, of course, I had lots of drafts before that. But that meant I had to be, if I had a block, I had to incorporate the block into the story. So, so beads and beads of, of red and all this stuff uh, got into the, into the whole mix. So that was another kind of collaboration. But it, it did also say to me, OK, if someone walks into a room while you are giving your poem, can it stand up to that moment? Can it? Can they still get into it in an occasional form? These kind of things, I think, can, can it, if, if you think of it more as a writing prompt and not as an, an absolute you know, life and death experience, they can really they can really help occasion the poem. And um, finally, I think I'll um, I'll talk about another one which I, I have some handouts which you can pick up at the end just if you want to see an image of something I was trying to find an image of some of these these works but one of my most uh, I think really one of my favorite uh, collaborations happened uh, with a um, interior architect interior design architect who had been commissioned to design the court the lobby of the courthouse, and the federal courthouse in Sacramento. And he contacted me and he said, I have an idea, but I don't know how to put it in. I want to have 12 marble chairs representing the jurors in the court room, in, in a lobby, in a circle. And he said, people can sit on them and all of that. But he said, I thought that maybe we could put some words on these chairs. And thought of that, I thought, well, wow, there, there they are in a circle. No beginning, no end. No one in the, in the, the spectator's ambush. This is the location you stumble into. And so, and what I thought was, well, why not have some interrupted thoughts of the jurors on the backs of those chairs? Things that, that don't make kind of a real narrative sense, but it's what they're thinking at the moment. And the challenge of it was, and the delight of it was actually, the fact that I never knew when the spectator would notice that there was poetry on the back of the chairs and would start to read. So it had to read in a circle. There was no beginning and there was no end. And it was, what, what happens there is that the, the words reverberate in that silence of, 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 of the, the spectator noticing it in the middle of the lobby. 
So those are also, you know, occasional moments. Um, I would go on. We could talk on and on, but I, I mean, one of my favorite things, and I'll end with this, is a poem that I was asked to write the Big Bird. Um, <laughs> You know, Sesame Street, you can't say no to Sesame Street. <laughs> and uh, what happened was, I'm going to find it in a minute. When I was Port Laureate, uh, Sesame Street contacted me and said, you know, would you, would you appear and talk about poetry to kids? And I said, sure. Uh, that sounds like my, my daughter loves it. I, I would give kudos for my daughter and, uh, at that time. And this is, um, it was really wonderful to be able to think of what a, a child would like to hear. And also the fact that there was a huge yellow bird <laughs> sitting next to you. And so uh, that, that was really a wonderful moment. I'm, I'm now, of course I can't find the poem because I don't do this, but I'll find it and I'll read it to you later, okay? I don't, I don't want to take up any more time from anyone else here. We have. Uh, all sorts of things to do. But uh, that's my take on the occasional poem. Don't let it get you down. <laughs>